Test, test, test.
Catherine, how are you? Not too bad, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Here's a program. Wonderful. One thing about the evening, there's not much announcements about what things are going to happen. Sometimes when a speaker's finished, he'll say, yeah. you know, we'll sing hymn or song. But if he doesn't, he'll just sit down and you just go. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So, yeah, they generally um, don't do a lot of announcing from element to element. But That's fine. it's pretty self-explanatory. I think so. Okay. Um, for the, after the, for during the collection, how long do you want me to give? Uh, just about two or three minutes. Okay. Okay. So that they can punch their thing in and whatnot, yep. so we can have that screen up there. Okay. With the information. Okay. Okay. Yep. So I'm good. All right. Um, <laughs> I will be standing in the doorway. Can you see me? Yeah. And I will raise my hand, and that will be the signal for the procession. Okay. Okay. The recessional. That's the end of the evening. The, the head usher, uh, which will be the evening lighter, will be coming up to the front to, to escort them out. So okay. you'll see that. I mean, it, it's the after all Canada, so you can break right, right into right, the right. Okay. Uh, recessional. Yep. But yeah, if you can just wait for me to, you know, just do a little something. Okay. Right around 8 o'clock? <laughs> yep, 8 o'clock. It's my rule. We start at 8 o'clock. Anybody okay. that comes like to the late like has to stand at the door until everybody is <laughs> in position. Okay, you're my kind of person. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we have any seniors going to use the elevator, but just in case that well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Yeah, I, I did ask, and everybody said they were good, but I can't have them on the left, but she's still managed here. But it's nice to have the elevator. Oh, and you got to put that light there. Of course. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go see how they're doing with the picture taking.
Good evening, brothers and sisters who are here and those joining us via live stream from around the world. Welcome to the 2021 Convocation of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. As we gather here this evening, let us begin this meeting by calling upon the name of God in prayer. O oh, Sovereign God, Almighty King, what a joy, what a blessing it is that we may gather here together this evening. We thank you that in the midst of ongoing restrictions, we may yet have this opportunity to meet face to face and online. We thank you, O oh Father, that you are the one who is in sovereign control that you are the one directing the course of the world, of the nations, that you are the one that makes such an evening like this possible. And we thank you, O oh Father, for the wonderful gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for the work that he could do. It is he who died, who rose, who ascended on high, and from your right hand he rules. And it is through him that all blessings flow. It is through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that you are gathering your church. And that work is going on throughout this world. And Father, we thank you that the good news may continue to go out that your church may be gathered here and throughout this world and to aid the spread of the gospel and the need for ministers of the word, you have blessed us with a most wonderful seminary, a much loved seminary, which in this past year, once again, so faithfully served the churches. We thank you, O oh Father, for the work of this past year that in the midst of restrictions, instruction at our seminary could continue and be completed. Father, we thank you for watching over the faculty, the staff, the students. We thank you above all for sparing the life of our dear brother, Dr. Ted Van Ralten and that you have also blessed him with recovery, and we pray that you will continue to give him more recovery and complete restoration of health and strength. Be near to him and Christine and their family. Father, we thank you that as this all transpired, you provided for our principal and faculty and staff that they could continue the work there at CRTS. Pray will you also be with those who have served before. Think of our professors in Meritai and their families, their spouses. Think of Sister Deddens in the Netherlands, that you continue to provide for her, granting her health and strength. But you've also been with Sister Margaret de Young, and that she continues to remain active in your service, in your kingdom. Pray also that you have been with Dr. Nikochis. You see continued decline in his health, and yet you continue to surround him and his wife, Dini, with your love and your care. And will you be with Dini as she continues to love and support Nik in these times? Father, we're also grateful for Dr. Keith and Dan. Dr. Jerry Vischer, that you have blessed them in their retirement, that they could continue to serve amongst your churches, preaching the gospel of salvation. And we pray, will you bless them in all their endeavors? Watch over Keith and Joanne and Jerry and Tini, and may they continue to rest in your sure promises. Father, we pray that you would be with us then this evening, that 
we may have a blessed time together. We're so grateful that this evening we have a keynote address from Dr. William Den Hollander. Will you bless him in his presentation? Father, we're also thankful for the support that we receive from the churches. We saw it again in this past year, and we also think of the churches in Australia for the support they continue to provide, and we pray that the churches may be blessed also through this evening. And will you look upon us now in grace and mercy, and hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. On a festive occasion as this, we also receive various letters and notes of congratulations. This evening, I'd like to share with you one such letter. This comes from the deputies for training for the ministry from Australia, from the Free Reformed Churches of Australia. And allow me, please, to share this with you. On the occasion of the 52nd anniversary and 47th convocation of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary, dear brothers and sisters, on behalf of the Free Reformed Churches of Australia, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We share our joy in the graduation of five students who have completed their academic studies. We congratulate you all, and brothers, we wish you God's rich blessings that you may joyfully take up your task in his kingdom. The work of the seminary is very dear to us. We have high regard for the task of the ministers of the gospel, for we love the glorious message of God's grace that these men may proclaim. Almost all of our serving ministers have had their training at CRTS. Our churches have been tremendously blessed by their ministry. We thank the Lord for the mutual trust respect and cooperation we have as federations. You are often in our prayers. May God continue to grant you the endurance, faithfulness, and humility you need to train up the next generation of ministers. With love from all of us down under, on behalf of the deputies for the training for the ministry, Reverend Dirk Poppy. In connection with the keynote address this evening. I'd like to at this time open Holy Scripture with you and read from the New Testament from the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8. If you wish to follow along, you'll find this also in the program. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacting on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach each one his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know him or know me 
from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so far, the reading of God's word. At this point, then, I may declare the 52nd anniversary and 47th convocation open. Brother Chairman, Governors, Senate, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, on an evening like this, where to begin? In the past academic year, there were many reasons for gratitude, but also many challenges to face. And looking ahead, we see things that excite us, but also some things that concern us. So where to begin? Some inspired words from Romans chapter 5 will give us the proper perspective this evening. And I quote, Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Now, to be honest, in this past academic year, we have not always felt like we were standing so firmly. As always, we started the academic year with a convocation, September the 11th, 2020, but it was different. Because for years, convocation stood, if I may say it that way, in the auditorium of Redeemer University. And it was also a, a standing tradition that hundreds of enthusiastic voices and one large, beautiful pipe organ joined together in jubilant praise to the Lord. And even after the official part of the convocation was over, many of us still stood around, socializing, meeting people that we perhaps hadn't spoken to for quite some time. And so convocation is always such an Uplifting, such an encouraging way to launch a new academic year. But Convocation 2020 did not quite stand in that tradition like other convocations. Something shifted, something moved. First of all, it, it moved to this building, Cornerstone Canadian Reformed Church. Now, please don't misunderstand. We are very thankful that this congregation has opened their building to host us now for two convocations. But with the physical distancing, with the, with the capacity limits, not only the location, but even something of the atmosphere of convocation shifted now for two years in a row. Still joyful. Still thankful. But now... As you can see, dozens of voices, not hundreds. Convocation to 2020 was a shift. But there were more movements, more adjustments that we had to make. During the academic year, and the students here will be able to tell you all about it, we, we shifted back and forth. At times, most of us were on campus, some online students joined us on the screen, but then a lockdown would be announced, and we all moved online, classroom to Zoom room. 
Then the lockdown was lifted. We transitioned back into our building, West 27th Street. Then another lockdown. And we moved back all online again. To be honest with you, it was tough stuff. And now we hope that this upcoming academic year will be more stable. We really hope that we'll just stay put for a whole year. Five faculty, three staff, 30 students on campus in the building and two more students joining us online. That's what we hope. But we don't know for sure. Will some more viral waves come crashing onto the shore of society, also sweeping our seminary community back and forth like a piece of driftwood on the tides of uncertainty? Actually, we're not in the mood to think about that. But we know the question hangs in the air. And yet, yet, brothers and sisters, through everything that happened in the past year, we actually did stand firmly. And looking ahead, we can say, even with confidence, we will stand firmly. Now you may ask, what kind of talk is that? What is this? False bravado? Maybe even arrogant? Overconfidence? It would be if we were talking about standing in and of ourselves. But we're taking the perspective of Romans 5 with us this evening. We focus on the Lord. We focus on what the Spirit-inspired Apostle announces so clearly through our risen, through our eternally invincible Lord Jesus Christ, we've obtained access through faith into sovereign, saving grace. And it's in that grace that we stood and we stand and we shall stand. Who knows? Maybe we will have to shift. Classrooms, Zoom rooms. But Christ, our King, will continue to stabilize us in the grace that he sovereignly, graciously obtained for us through his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. And standing there in his grace, we can look ahead with joy Listening back to the words of the Apostle Paul, he assures us of that joy either way. If our hearts, he says, are filled, filled to the brim with the hope of the glory of God, we will rejoice. Verse 2. But even if our weary souls are, are dragged down from the sufferings, we'll still rejoice. Because the Spirit of Christ is hard at work in us individually, communally, producing more endurance, more spiritual stamina, more character, more hope in our God. And allow me then to briefly take this perspective of Romans 5 and share some concrete details from life at the seminary in the past year and upcoming year. I'll follow a number of headings. First of all, the past academic year. In spite of all of the changes, every single course was completed. All the students finished their work, all the students advanced to the next year. And that in and of itself is a reason, as the Apostle Paul says, for rejoicing. And by God's grace, we may even present to you this evening five more graduates. Four from the Master of Divinity program. One is now eligible for call. 
Two have chosen to do an additional internship so that they may be better prepared to serve in gospel ministry. One has decided to serve the Lord in other capacities. And in addition, our graduate this evening from the bachelor program, who cannot be with us, but he's already busy serving his congregation in the Philippines. And I know you want to hear more about them, you want to hear the names, but I'm going to leave that to my colleague, Dr. Den Hollander, in just a few moments. Then, the upcoming academic year. This evening, we welcome 12 new incoming students. Here's the list. Master of Divinity students and where they come from. Damon Bosveldt, Western Australia. Mitchell Bosveldt, Western Australia. Hongdi Chen, from China via Montreal, Quebec to Hamilton. Rhys Gallard, Saskatchewan. Todd Lindy, Ontario. Joshua Schutten, Ontario. Fred Struick, British Columbia. Adrian Tams, Alberta. Quinton Vandermeulen, Manitoba. Mark Vermeulen, Ontario. As well as two new bachelor students, Jasmine Barbosa, Brazil, Jacobo Pacheco, the Philippines. Think of all those different provinces. Think of all those different countries. Think of 12 incoming students. And that, brothers and sisters, following up on one of the most challenging years that we've all had in recent memory. This is noteworthy. As church communities, we have prayed. We have prayed for more students to come. And now, God is bringing them. Our student body now numbers 32. Romans 5, our Redeemer does provide joy, also in times of suffering. Welcome to all of our new students, each and every one of you. May you soon feel at home in our midst. Next, faculty and staff. About halfway through the past academic year, our office administrator, Catherine McKelsey, was admitted to the hospital. The serious case of COVID. And then, as you well know, about one month later, one of our professors, Dr. Ted Van Ralty, was also hospitalized for an extended period of time. Very serious brain injury after a snowmobile crash. And yet, by God's grace, both our sister McKelsey, our brother Van Ralty, are both with us here in the building. More importantly, they're carrying on their tasks in the other building, the seminary. And again, we would be really remiss if we didn't pause here for a moment, take note, and praise and thank the Lord for these remarkable gifts of healing. And I also know from both of them that they deeply, deeply appreciate all the prayer, all the care from the seminary, from the broader church community that supported them through their most difficult days. And I also want to thank on the behalf of our seminary, everyone, and it is quite a sizable list of people, everyone who stepped up to the plate so cheerfully, so willingly, to fill in the tasks that needed to be done. Next heading, special occasions. Earlier this summer, Dr. and Mrs. Van Damme celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And Lord willing, in October, Dr. Van Damme will commemorate 50 years in the ministry. What milestones. Also, this past summer, my wife and I could commemorate our 25th wedding anniversary. And today, we remember our brother, Dr. Nick Kochis, and his wife, Dini, who are marking their 45th wedding anniversary. Now, all of these circumstances that surround these special occasions are different, as we know, but it's the same Lord who gives them all. We thank you. 
Next, distance education. In the past year, international travel was difficult, if not impossible, at times, and for this reason, five of our students joined our classes online, from South Africa, from Korea, and from the Philippines. Thanks to a recent technology upgrade at CRTS, we were all surprised, honestly, at how smoothly this went. Each class starting with just a tap on the tablet, people around the globe joined together. In the meantime, our creditor, the Association of Theological Schools, fully approved the distance education program, and you may be thinking, but is it not best still that future ministers and, and future missionaries would be trained on campus, face to face, in person? We agree, wholeheartedly. Board of Governors agrees, wholeheartedly. Our students agree wholeheartedly. And so our seminary, also with the Board of Governors, goes forward with this technology, with this principle, on campus as much as possible, online as much as necessary. There are times, student permits, health crises, extenuating circumstances when a student can't make it, simply can't make it to Hamilton. In the past, there was little we could do. Now we and they have possibilities and we can carry on. We thank the Lord for that. Looking ahead, last heading. I actually wish, brothers and sisters, that you could have had a peek in the chapel at the seminary this past week. There was a group there, governors, faculty, staff, a retired professor, two alumni, two current students, about 25 people. We read, we prayed, we sang, and then there were all kinds of different ideas, floated, refined. Care was taken that we didn't overextend ourselves, but also paid attention to what needed to be improved. And so what was this all about? Sometimes it's called strategic planning. Maybe it would be better called taking stock of blessings and asking ourselves, can we use them any more effectively? But in sum, we rallied around this commitment, renewed, to serve our supporting churches, and particularly in the best possible way, focus on the need for more ministers and missionaries in our midst. Brothers and sisters, the passage that I opened with, Romans 5, speaks about hope, true hope. It's not wishful thinking. It's not some human aspiration that fizzles. It's genuine, divinely crafted hope. The hope of the glory of our God. And that hope is firm. It's unshakable. And in the grace that gives that hope, we stand. Thank you.
Good evening. Before I began preparing for tonight, I had to look up the last year's convocation address to see how properly to address you. So, dear Mr. Chairman, Board of Governors, Senate, brothers and sisters in Christ, seminary community, it's a privilege to be here tonight and to have this opportunity to share my inaugural address. The title, as you can see in the, in the program, is Christ and the True Temple. Anyone who's been to the modern city of Jerusalem can picture in their minds the iconic view of the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. It's one of the first places you visit when you go to Jerusalem, as my family did, had the privilege of doing in 2010. And that's where you go. You go to see the Temple Mount from a distance where you can see it all laid out before your eyes. It's the place you get your tourist group photos taken, as we did a couple of years ago in 2019. The Temple Mount in particular dominates the skyline. And your eyes are constantly drawn to the golden dome of the rock. It's an impressive sight. And even if you haven't had the opportunity to see it in person, I, I think most of you will be able to see in your mind's eye something of that sight. Well, what you see today pales in comparison to the first century experience. The second temple, which was there in Jesus' day, at first was a modest building. It was built some 600 years before Jesus Christ by the exiles under Zerubbabel. And it was a, a bit of a pitiful structure for those who remembered Solomon's temple. In fact, they wept when they saw that temple. But fast forward 600 years, and King Herod, nicknamed the Great, as part of his building program, rebuilt the Temple Mount. He built these massive stones that you can still see today at the Western or the Wailing Wall. These massive stones that established a, a, a 14 hectare, a 14 hectare Temple Mount, and re, rebuilt the Temple as well, outstripping Zerubbabel's Temple in, in a great deal. It was actually one of the largest rebuilding projects in the history of the ancient world. It made the Temple in Jerusalem the most stunning temple building in the entirety of the Roman Empire. According to a later Christian writer, the Emperor Titus, who came and visited that place, well actually he was the one who would destroy it later, but the Emperor Titus wanted to preserve the temple, it was said, because it was the crowning jewel of the empire. The Jewish Talmud put it even more strongly, it said that ten measures of beauty were given by God to the world and nine were apportioned out to Jerusalem and one was left for the rest of the world. Another rabbi proclaimed that no one has truly seen a beautiful building unless he has seen the temple. And the great Jewish historian Josephus, whom you'll hear more about, and the students in particular will hear much more about Josephus, he, he claimed that when you came and saw the temple in the morning, that the way the sun shone off of the walls was so brilliant that you had to avert your eyes. It was as though you were staring at the very sun itself. And so it's not surprising then that one moment when Jesus was teaching in the temple, as he was leaving the temple with his disciples, the disciples called his attention to this beautiful structure, this magnificent building. They said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what beautiful buildings. But rather than being impressed or affirming them in their admiration, Jesus' reply was striking. He said, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And indeed, 40 years, some 40 years later, the words of Jesus came true after a four-year war between Roman, the Roman legionaries and the Jewish rebels. In the heat of battle, a Roman soldier tossed a torch into the temple against Titus' wishes, Josephus claims, and Unable to put the fire out, the temple was destroyed and not one stone was left on another. In fact, if you go to the Temple Mount today and you go just a little over to the right of the Wailing Wall, just underneath Robinson's Arch, you can see a pile of stones. They've been there for 1950 years, thrown down from the Temple Mount and there they lie today. The words of Jesus came true. Now, the temple destruction was a historical moment that is significant in anyone's estimation. It was certainly traumatic, of course, for the generation that experienced it. One modern Jewish theologian reflecting on the destruction of the temple and the, and the loss of life in the first Jewish revolt called this time the birthplace of Holocaust theology. He compared it to the events of our own century. For him, it prompts the question, why? That is, how could this happen to the people of God? 
It's the same question that the historian Josephus sought to answer. Why? How could this happen to the people of God? But it wasn't just a horrific tragedy for that first generation. It wasn't just a significant historical event. Uh, Historians call it a watershed moment. That is, it marked a, a change in the course of human history. And especially when we consider the parting of the ways, as they call it, that is the separation between Christianity and, and Judaism. Even apart from that, in the history of Judaism itself, it sparked a, a change. Rabbinic Judaism came to dominate. The temple ministry, of course, was gone, and since then, the synagogue has achieved more prominence. The Jewish people have become a people of the book and not a people of the temple. But tonight I want to ask a question. Did you ever think of the destruction of the temple as a redemptive historical moment. One of our Canadian Reformed distinctives and indeed a heritage of the Canadian Reformed churches is our focus on redemptive history. Indeed, we pride ourselves on preaching redemptive historically. The question is, how does the temple destruction fit into all this? Do you see it as one of those great historical events that moved forward the plan and the process of redemption that God was at work providing in those centuries. The first century, of course, was full of redemptive historical moments, the most significant redemptive historical moments. That's why the calendar pivots around those central events, the birth of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension from the dead, his session to the right hand of the Father, the outpouring of his spirit on Pentecost. The question is, does the destruction in AD 70 have a place among them? I don't think we've been inclined to think so. It's not entirely surprising. After all, it takes place some 40 years after these other events take place. What's more, it perhaps happens after all the New Testament books are written, depending on who you ask. It happens after Pentecost as well, and and we're accustomed to thinking that Pentecost was the last great event, redemptive historically, until the coming of Christ. And yet, If you read your Bible carefully, if you read your New Testament carefully, the events of AD 70 receive a lot of attention. A lot of attention. Now, as I say that, I know that some of you are edging to the fronts of your seats, and some of you on your couches at home are edging to the front of your couches, because just how much attention the temple destruction receives is a matter of some debate. The passages that clearly point forward to the destruction of the temple are are hard to understand and difficult to interpret. And not everyone even agrees that the temple destruction is in view in other places, like the book of Hebrews or the book of Revelation. There will be some challenging debates to deal with if I were to to present you with a comprehensive account tonight. Thankfully, Catherine said 25 minutes, and so that's all I've got for you tonight. Plus, I think it's going to take me a lifetime to tackle this question. In any case, there's enough undisputed and clear references to the temple destruction in scriptures to begin to answer the question, what is the redemptive historical significance of the events of AD 70. That's what I want to explore for the remainder of this address. And lest you think this is going to be just a dry historical exercise, let me say from the outset that my hope is that by the end of this, you'll see and marvel even more at the radiance and the glory of Christ our Savior. That it will give greater de- delight and deeper joy to those who have the privilege of preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that it will cause all of us to long even more eagerly for the return of Christ. But Before we get to that point, we have to give a sober and somber answer to the question, what is the redemptive historical significance of the temple destruction? It's a perspective that Jesus actually gives us himself in what I think are one of the most powerful moments in the Gospels. It's immediately after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You'll know the scene if you're familiar with the New Testament. The crowd has paved the way for Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. They've laid down their, their palm branches. They've lined the streets with their cloaks, and they're crying out as Jesus enters on a, on a donkey, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. You have to imagine that for the disciples and for the followers of Jesus, this is a heady moment. They're, they're thinking to themselves, Finally. Finally, the kingship of Jesus is going to be recognized. Finally, we're going to see something of the glory of the Son of God. A a moment of overwhelming joy and excitement. But the response of Jesus is much different. As he approaches the city, and remember what I told you earlier about what Josephus said about the, the sun reflecting off of the walls of the temple, as he approaches the city, he weeps. Far from the excitement of the crowds, Jesus weeps when he sees the city. 
He knows already then, of course, that the crowds who are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, will later on be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. He knows that, but there's more in his heart at this moment. This is the prophecy he makes at that time. He says, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Why did the temple fall? What is the redemptive historical significance of the destruction of the temple in AD 70? Well, the first answer is that the people of God did not know the time of their visitation. The Messiah had come, and because they rejected him, and because they crucified him, the temple would be destroyed. That's why the temple of God would stand there, no stone left upon another. It was a direct consequence of the rejection of the Messiah, the dayspring who had visited them from on high, as Luke put it. You may recall that this was the same warning that Jesus gave in the parable of the, the wicked tenants. When the servants were sent to collect the rent from the wicked tenants, collect the fruit of the vineyard, they were beaten and mistreated. When the king decided, I will send my only son, surely they will respect him and they, they killed him. Well, Jesus ended the parable with a pointed question. He said, what will the master do when he comes to them at the vineyard? He will come and destroy those tenants and give their vineyard to others. Now, for anyone who knows the Old Testament, the idea that the temple could be destroyed for the sins of the people is, is not a surprise. In fact, the very language that Jesus uses are taken from the Old Testament. He casts it in the same language as it was destroyed some 600 years before. The people of God knew that the temple could be destroyed for the sins of the people. In fact, that, that was Josephus' answer. It was for the sins of the people. But there's more to the picture. And here's where we get to the good stuff. There's more to the picture that destruction doesn't just reveal the discipline of God, it reveals the grace and the mercy of God. It reveals the very depth and the wonder of the gospel itself. And we get a hint of this in the words that Jesus quotes right after he tells that parable. He quotes from Psalm 118. Have you not read this scripture? He asked his disciples. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You see, the destruction was related to the rejection of Jesus, to be sure. But it was also related to the glorious reality that what was happening was a new cornerstone was being laid, a new foundation was being laid in that very moment. Why was the old temple destroyed? Because the new temple, the true temple, Jesus Christ himself had arrived on the scene. This was the doing of the Lord. And it was an infinitely more marvelous reality than all the copies and the shadows of the old covenant. That's the message of, of Hebrews throughout. But it comes down to the temple destruction specifically in the last verse of what we read earlier. Where the author of Hebrews says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And actually, I would prefer to translate those last words, is ready to be destroyed. That is, the, the destruction of the temple was inevitable because the new had come. As, as the author of Hebrews triumphantly pronounces, it was a better covenant, it was a better priest with better promises and a better temple. The question, of course, is, well, what, where was this better temple? Where was this cornerstone? Where was this foundation? Well, the glorious answer is not a what, but it's a, it's a who. It's Christ himself. The reason that the old temple became obsolete and fading and had to vanish away, had to be destroyed, was because the glorious new temple had come in Christ Jesus. It's the Gospel of John that teaches us this so wonderfully and beautifully in the very opening part of the Gospel. It makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the new and the true temple of God. And the word became flesh, he wrote, and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. He dwelt among us, or to translate the Greek even more precisely, he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. 
You see, Christ was the dwelling place of God on earth. Christ is the place where heaven and earth meet. Christ is our Emmanuel. He is our God with us. We have seen his glory, writes John. Not the glory cloud that filled the old covenant temple in the desert at Sinai, but the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, as Hebrews puts it. We have seen his glory, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, as Paul teaches us. Now recall, of, recall what I said about what Josephus said of that temple standing there with the sun shining on it in its brilliance. Recall what the rabbis said of the beauty of that temple structure. It pales in comparison to the beauty and the radiance of the true temple of God, of Jesus Christ. The radiance of whose glory causes men to fall down on their faces in worship. You see, Christ is the fulfillment of all the old covenant meeting places, all of the tabernacles, all of the temples, but not just the fulfillment. He was their very substance. They were simply copies and shadows. He was the real thing. He was the true temple. How could the old temple remain standing when the glorious new temple was at hand? That's why, too, the the structure of the temple goes hand in hand with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. That much is clear from John's gospel as well. John tells us about a crucial conversation between Jesus and the Jews. Immediately after he cleanses the temple, turns over the money tables, gets rid of the the money changers and the, the animal sellers, And those who are watching ask him the question, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Well, they didn't understand. He said, well, this temple has been built in 46 years and are you going to raise it again in three days? Well, John teaches us the meaning of Jesus' words. He was speaking about the temple of his body. When he therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember what he had said and knew the truth of the word that Jesus had spoken. Not only was the crucifixion the destruction of Christ's body, it was the beginning of the end for the temple. It pointed forward to the coming destruction of the temple. More than that, it was the beginning of it. As soon as that curtain tore in two from top to bottom, the fate of the temple was ensured. The old had to pass away because the new had come. That's why the temple was destroyed. The shadow was making way for the reality. And then the resurrection of Christ was the rebuilding of a temple not made with hands. But there's more. There's more because the temple was not just the place where God dwelled with his people. The vision of the temple was to expand until the whole earth was filled with the presence of God, until the whole earth was the place of his glory. That's why when the temple curtain is torn in two, it's not just the temple that is shaken, the whole world, the whole earth shakes. There's an earthquake and the rocks break open. The old creation is passing away. In the destruction of the temple is the destruction of the old creation and the coming of the new. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth. We are living in the already of the already but not yet. Now we don't have time to trace the progress of this glorious temple building project through the church, the body of Christ. But let's take a peek. Because the true temple established in the death and resurrection of Jesus is continuing to be built. Jesus was only the cornerstone, the foundation. And we ourselves as living stones are set on that foundation and being built into a temple, the temple of the living God, the place where God himself dwells. That's what Christ is busy with also here in our churches. Also through the work that's being done in the seminary, Christ is busy, busy building his temple. The foundation has already been laid. There can only be one foundation, Jesus Christ, the one in whom all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. Sometimes I've been asked, since taking up this position, what's your vision for the seminary? How do you see your place at the seminary? And sometimes I wonder the same. Those are good questions to wonder about. That's why we spent this strategic planning session as well, thinking about what is our vision 
But the question that, or the answer I keep referring myself back to is this. And what I want to emphasize tonight is this as well, that Jesus Christ is the foundation. That Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. That Jesus Christ as well is the builder. The one who is at work establishing this temple here on earth. And as we continue on our work here as professors, as students, as we study the word of God together, as we serve in the churches, as we go out and preach the gospel, we are simply building on that one foundation. And in fact, it is Christ through his spirit who is at work within us and through us, building on that foundation. And it is Christ alone who will ensure the completion of this glorious temple building, this place of God's presence You see, the new heavens and the new earth will be fully ushered in when Christ returns in the clouds of heaven, our radiant prophet, priest, and king. Listen to John's vision. You want a vision for the future? Listen to John's vision of the glorious new creation. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need for moon to shine in it, For the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. This is the glorious future for which we long. This is the glorious future we have the privilege of working towards in this place and around the globe. And we long for the day when the dwelling of God will be with men. He will dwell with them. He will dwell with us. And we will be his people. And God himself will be with us as our God. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, thank you.
Raoul Jacob Kingma. Raoul was born and raised in the Niagara Peninsula in rural southern Ontario. After high school, he went to university to become a mechanical engineer and later moved to British Columbia to finish his engineering education. During that time, he met Sarah at Stepping Stones Bible Camp, and to put it in his own words, he was rather enamored. After two years of traveling between the Fraser Valley and the Edmonton area, they were married in 2012. After his studies were completed, Raoul worked as an engineer in the Vancouver area for five years. Over that time, he developed a love for theology. And having decided to pursue pastoral ministry, began to study Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. He and Sarah moved to Hamilton in 2017 with two sons, Rory and Matthias. Over the course of his studies, Raoul undertook summer internships with John Lowers in Hamilton, Eric Watkins at Covenant OPC in Florida, and Reverend Dick Winea in Lincoln. In 2020, he and Sarah received their third son, Owen. After much reflection and prayer over the past year, Raoul and Sarah made the difficult decision not to go before classes to seek a call from the churches. He still desires to use his training and gifts in other ways for the benefit of Christ's church, and indeed he'll be using those to benefit the CRTS community this coming year with some part-time work as a teaching assistant. He's also taken up work in engineering again. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Raoul Jacob Kingma. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you, Raoul Jacob Kingma, the Master of Divinity degree. Raoul, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. 2 Timothy, for, 2 Timothy 1, verse 14. Ruert Wibren Offringa. Ruert is our most international student. He was born in the Netherlands but moved to Manitoba at a young age. That's where he spent most of his formative years, but he did move back to the Netherlands for a brief period of time. When he was 17, he moved with his family to New Zealand where he got a business degree. He then moved to Australia where he taught for 10 years at John Calvin Christian College. That's also where he met and eventually married Tara. God has blessed him with three children, Daniel, Anna, and Michael, born just a few weeks ago. Ruth's desire to pursue gospel ministry was there at a young age, but it was only while he was teaching in Australia that he began to take steps in that direction, beginning his studies of the biblical languages and Latin. During his time at CRTS, Ruth enjoyed internships with Reverend Rodney Vermeulen, then at Trinity Canref in Glanbrook, with Reverend Paul Aisman at Streetlight in Hamilton, and with Reverend Carlo Jansen in Willoughby Heights, British Columbia. You'll have to excuse Ruert if he's stepping a little lightly this evening. Just two days ago, he sustained his preparatory exam and is declared eligible for call in the churches. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Ruert Wiebren Offringa. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you Ruert Wiebren Offringa, the Master of Divinity degree. Bert, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Kevin Jacob Starr. Kevin grew up in Surrey, BC, attending William of Orange and Credo Christian Schools. For his post-secondary studies, he attended the University of the Fraser Valley and the University of British Columbia. During most of his teenage years, he worked in the fields of Two E's Farm, a name familiar to anyone who spent time in the Fraser Valley. And in the summer of 2017, he packed up his trusty red Mazda and made his way to the mountain of Hamilton. Over the course of his four years at CRTS, not only did Kevin acquire a lot of knowledge, he also acquired a house cat. How that exactly happened remains a mystery, but those who were in class with him certainly are familiar with it because it made a lot of appearances on Zoom. <laughs> Over the course of his studies, Kevin did an orientation internship with Pastors Bill DeYoung and Hilmer Jagerspa on the Blessings Congregation. His mission internship after second year was spent in the ERQ churches of Quebec. 
but given that his mandatory Canadian French training was conducted in British Columbia, communication with the locals was challenging. <laughs> in the summer of 2020, he spent time in Dunville, Ontario, working under the guidance of Reverend John Van Winberg. He is currently enjoying an internship in Ottawa at the Jubilee Canadian Reformed Church, serving alongside Pastor Winston Bosch. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Kevin Jacob Starr. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you, Kevin Jacob Starr, the Master of Divinity degree. Kevin, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Titus 2, verse 7. Timothy John Veenstra. Tim is our homegrown talent, born and raised right here in Hamilton above his parents' fish and chips store. He attended Timothy Christian School in Guido de Brea Christian High School, where he met and fell in love with his wife, Kristen. She knew what she was getting into as far as being the wife of a student and or pastor is concerned, because Tim's desire to preach the gospel originated when he was already four years old. After completing a degree in philosophy at McMaster University, sticking with the Hamilton theme, Tim enrolled at CRTS. During his time here, God blessed Tim and Kristen with a son, Ezra, and they're currently expecting another child. The past few summers, Tim did internships with Reverend Tony Raukema at Ebenezer Burlington, with Reverend Richard Bolcha at River of Life URC in Niagara Falls, and Reverend Matthew Van Lewick at Grace Brampton. He also taught catechism at Redemption in Flamborough for some time. Since finishing his training at CRTS, Tim has been serving Mercy Christian Church as an intern and will continue to do so until December when he plans to present himself to classes for examination. His desire to pursue gospel ministry is still strong. In case you're worried, Tim has been outside of the greater Hamilton area. In fact, he just returned from a visit to family in Ireland. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Timothy John Veenstra. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you, Timothy John Veenstra, the Master of Divinity degree. Tim, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. Kim Lapiz. Kim was our first ever Filipino student. The Philippines is a predominantly Roman Catholic country, but Kim grew up in an evangelical turned Pentecostal church. The Reformed doctrines of grace were unfamiliar to Kim for most of his life, but by God's grace and providence, a reformation of sorts has been happening in the Philippines in recent years. In the early 2000s, Kim and several others in his church community became increasingly convinced of the scriptural truth of Reformed doctrine and separated to form their own community of faith. Since then, God has blessed their efforts with the institution of Jaira Reformed Church, where Kim serves as pastor, and an increasing number of other churches that desire to grow in their understanding of the gospel of grace. In fact, one of the pastors of a neighboring church, Mustard Seed Reformed Church, Pastor Jack Pacheco, is just beginning his seminary training at CRTS next week. In 2013, the Providence Church here in Hamilton formed TAP, Theological Assistance for the Philippines, and their efforts in the Philippines led to the proposal in 2017 that Kim should study here at CRTS. Under God's blessing, he received the appropriate paperwork, and Kim was able to pursue his Bachelor of Theology degree here, the first two years in person and the last year on Zoom. Kim's faithful attendance was an inspiration to us all, especially uh, to those in the freshman classroom when we had our introductory class to biblical hermeneutics in the afternoon here, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, Kim's time. Kim has taken up his work again at Jaira Reformed Church, and we're excited to see Christ's work of reforming the church continue in the Philippines. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Bachelor of Theology, Mr. Kim Lapiz. And also on behalf of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, the degree of Bachelor of Theology is conferred upon Kim Lapiz, although he is not with us this evening. 
Thank you. You may all be seated except uh, Raul. Oh, we should clap, yes. <laughs> and cheer. <laughs> now you can sit down. We are proud of you. No? <laughs> What's that? We were told this by Captain Stay here. Okay. Okay, well you can stay. <laughs> no, I, I have some I have a special surprise. There it's it didn't make it into the program. This is always a, something of a surprise. It's the it's the Sellis Book Prize. Um, usually it's not an entire surprise. It shows up in the program and the mystery is who uh, gets the Sellis Book Prize. It's a, a prize named in honor of our first New Testament professor, uh, Professor Sellis. And so as the new professor of New Testament, I have the privilege of, of awarding this prize. It's not given out every year, but it's given when someone performs particularly well in the field of New Testament studies. Well, tonight I have the privilege of giving that prize to Raul Kingma. Although I only had the privilege of teaching him for one year, it was immediately clear to me that he is eminently deserving of this book prize. In his final Greek exam this past year, he not only provided excellent translations of the passages on the exam, but he gave alternate translations, multiple alternate translations that should be considered as well in brackets. In fact, I was tempted to take his exam and send it to the editors of the ESV for their consideration. <laughs> then in our New Testament exegesis class, we delved into the letter of First Peter, as faithful readers of Clarion will already know. That was a test, by the way. <laughs> In chapter 3, there's a passage that's regarded as perhaps the most difficult passage in the New Testament to understand. Who are the spirits in prison, Peter is speaking about? When and how did Christ preach to them? And what does it mean that baptism now saves you? Rather than saving the students and omitting that from the list of assignments, and rather than covering it myself, I decided to handpick a couple of students uh, and assign it to them. And those I figured was up to, were up to the challenge. They were, and Ray was one of them. He did not let me down one bit. In fact, he almost had me convinced that his interpretation was correct. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure, Raul, to present you with this Ellis Book Prize. Now welcome Kevin Starr up to speak a word for the graduating students. Um, Catherine didn't give me a time limit, so. <laughs> but I think I ended up with this role because I'm known for having short speeches in chapels, so. Um, it's tradition to have one student give a reflection on our time at CRTS as the graduating class. And well, we've now done it. 55 courses, 131 credits, an all but complete loss of the, what little Latin we knew, <laughs> and four or in Kim's case, three years later, we've completed our studies at CRTS. But perhaps more impressive than all of that is the fact that it has been 18 months without a single email, and I looked this up, a single email regarding dirty dishes in the kitchen sink. <laughs> in the lockdown, it certainly played a key role in those 18 months and it certainly had a significant impact on our studies and our life at the college. We had to adjust to work from home. And there were increased distractions that came with this. Some of us are, um, were working alongside young children who were also working on their own schoolwork. Offices that doubled as bedrooms or laundry rooms were used. And sometimes you would go to the washroom during a lecture only to find your roommate doing yoga in the living room. And we do, of course, have... 
Oh dear. We do, of course, have many memories of life at CRTS that don't deal directly with the lockdown. Uh, one particular year in December, we, you, we always have a, a photo in December. In one particular year, we decided to have some ugly Christmas sweaters instead of the, the regular nice-looking attire, and we decided not to tell the staff about this. But much to Raoul and my dismay, we were perhaps the only ones, at least from the graduating class, to show up with ugly Christmas sweaters. And perhaps even more to our dismay, the staff were thrilled with the idea. <laughs> so I guess that all worked out in the end. The sermon session was often a highlight for students. You, you of course, learn how to improve your speech through the instruction of your professors, you also learn how to improve your presentation from the slip-ups of others. One particular time, this isn't really a slip-up, this is just a matter of, of personality. Dr. DeVisser tried to illustrate the difference between a presentation and how your facial expressions can impact your presentation. And he presented this difference using word and Raoul. He mentioned that one was naturally stern and another was naturally smiley. And he concluded with something like, Rurd, you and I have to deal with what we have. <laughs> another time, Tim, caught, Tim taught us the importance of thinking clearly when you're delivering a message. This was shortly after becoming a new dad. And apparently, to him, being all things to all people, like Paul, impacts not just how and when we meet people, but also our feeding schedules. <laughs> and in one of Raoul's first sermon proposals, he reminded us of choosing carefully who you make eye contact with. He was using a friend who had suffered an, an injury as an example and first he looked at me, and I knew this friend, so I started smiling. And then he looked to the other side at another person, and this person happened to be a cousin of this friend, and he started smiling. And I think Ray and a few of us had a hard time keeping it together at that point. And I'd also be remiss not to mention the lesson I was taught about knowing your pulpit. <laughs> Earlier this year, there was a somewhat viral and awkward video in which the weight of my sermon caused the entire pulpit to collapse. And this was not in sermon session, but in a church service. Another time in one of our ministry and, and mission courses, my laptop decided to enter airplane mode. And that's not to say that it lost Wi-Fi, but it, that it sounded like it was going to take off. <laughs> and each time you thought those fans couldn't sound any louder, they did sound louder. And all of this took place while Dr. Visser, Dr. DeVisser was trying to pray. That laptop is no longer with us. <laughs> Rurd, um, towards the end of our studies at CRTS, he provided us with some insight into how he has managed to complete the assigned readings. And it's perhaps good advice, especially for the freshmen. His assumption was that if professors assign so many readings, they must have also given us enough time to do them. And therefore, his suggestion was to do your readings first and use the time that remained for your papers and other assignments. And if the reading notes that he shared with us are any indication, Rude has indeed managed to complete all of the readings assigned to us, and you may want to ask him for a copy of those notes. 
in our New Testament exegesis course this past year, the senior students studied 1 Peter. We studied the book in its entirety. We went through it verse by verse. Each student was assigned a different section. And there was a, a bit of over-analysis of why each student was assigned their section. This came about because Dr. Den Hollander explained that He explained that he had given the difficult passages to students who he had high expectations of, let's say, and that, for instance, the passage dealing with marriage should be given to a, a married man who had been married or has been married for quite some time. But as seminary students, it's our job to overanalyze things. So the fact that he had said that these passages were not randomly assigned kind of hung over us. And naturally, <laughs> the question arose why Tim, in particular, was given the passage in chapter 4, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, <laughs> living in sensuality, <laughs> passions, <laughs> etc. But enough about us. <clears throat> to begin, I, I wish to express our thankfulness to our, our fellow students past and present, to our thankfulness for your camaraderie, for your, for your prayer support as we prayed together and for one another, with one another, for the encouragement that we received from each other. And for the love and the bonds that have grown among the student body, even during the midst of lockdowns and, and uncertain futures. And on behalf of the graduating students, I also wish to thank the staff, the faculty, and the Board of Governors for your diligence and hard work, particularly as you had to deal with ever-changing rules and regulations. And you were certainly presented with unique and unwanted, perhaps, challenges over the last two years. But by God's grace, you were able to cope with those challenges in a way that allowed us to continue our studies. Thank you to the professors for your diligence in teaching us over these last four years, and to all the guest lecturers in that time as well. There's no doubt that we at times tried your patience and some of us perhaps more than others. And yet your dedication and your love for our God and his gospel has shaped and molded each one of us. Thank you to the community of Christian brothers and sisters, to our family and friends, to all of those who have supported us through your prayers, through your messages, and also through your financial gifts. It was always encouraging to know that our fellow Christians were praying for the students here at the seminary and that they were willing to support the training of, of students who wanted to dig deeper into the Word of God. Thank you also to the various pastors and councils that mentored us over our summer internships and who continue to mentor us now. We thank you for your willingness and for your efforts. As students, we certainly have a lot to be thankful for. And above all else, we have to thank our faithful and loving God because it was he who gave us the strength and the endurance to complete our studies. It was he who blessed us with the knowledge that we needed to finish our studies here at CRTS, and he provided us with faithful professors, faithful lecturers, and mentors to teach us in the way of the Lord. It was he who gave the staff strength and energy so that seminary life could continue throughout these years. That seminary life could run smoothly even when it was forced to change into ways we perhaps didn't like. 
and our God and Father sustained the students and professors as we were all challenged and in many ways pushed to our limits during these times. And it's our God and Father who, of course, preserved Dr. Van Ralty and has granted him a recovery, and he has also provided us with guest lecturers in the time of his recovery. And so this convocation and this graduation ceremony, it isn't so much about us, it isn't so much about what we have done or what we have... Well, it, it is about what we have learned, but it's about what God has taught us through human instruments and through human means. It's about a faithful and loving father who continues to care for his children. And so, to God, be, uh, to God alone be the glory. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board and faculty, graduates and guests, brothers and sisters. Are libraries exciting? What about money? I suppose you'd get incredibly varied answers to both of these questions. Now from the Women's Savings Action perspective, these two things combined can definitely be exciting. The reps get excited when their brothers and sisters are willing to generously support their seminary. The librarian, Mrs. Elkema, gets excited when she has the means and resources to equip and maintain the library. The professors get excited when it comes time to order books and journals that are the necessary tools for teaching and research, and they have the sufficient funds to do so. And the students marvel at the resources they can delve into. It does beg the question, however, how do we maintain the level of excitement among our supporting churches for the seminary library every year again? It's hard to imagine, but the $35,000 that we've been giving for the last number of years has not been quite enough to pay all the bills. This year, we decided to make a video for children about the seminary and the seminary library. We hope to ask our Women's Savings Action reps to show this in the elementary schools in their area to increase awareness of the need that our seminary library has. Here's a little trailer for you. Hello everyone. Welcome to CRTS, Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. Now we are in what we call the freshman classroom. Now freshman classroom is like grade one at your school. 
We also call this the chapel room because every week we meet together as students and professors for a chapel, which is a time of worship. Welcome to CRTS. I'm uh, Mrs. Alkema. I work in the library here and I'm really excited that your great fourth boss has been able to come here. How many books do you have? So last time I counted, it took me a while, it was uh, 35,915. Okay, so I mentioned that we have over 35,000 books, uh, but we also, what I didn't talk about is we have tons of books on the computer. E-books, electronic books. How much do the books cost? So some books don't cost that much, maybe $30. Do you think $30 is a lot of money for a book? No. No. What if I said some books cost $150 or $200? How much do those databases cost? They are very expensive and you have to keep renewing it. So you got to keep going out every year and you got to buy another, buy the same database, pay the license again. Where does the money come from? So the money comes from actually a lot of different people, from people in the churches. And um, there are ladies in every congregation called, they work for the Women's Savings Action. They put a notice in the bulletin and then all the ladies in the congregation, all the families donate money. All the money is collected. It goes in a special bank account. And then the executive of the Women's Savings Action, they count it all up, decide how much, figure out how much money they have. And then that money is presented to the library. I'm going to ask you a question. Does anyone here know who their Women's Savings Action representative is in the congregation? Mrs. Ludwig. student, he needs to write a sermon on, on Genesis 8 verse 6 through 19. Help him find two commentaries to use in, in writing his sermon. Please help a student. He's preparing a series of sermons on Joshua and he needs help to understand the geography of King. How large was the city of Jericho? Please help a student. He is writing an essay about the worship service. Please find a book in the stack downstairs that will help him. special thank you to Margaret, the professors, and the grade four students with their teacher, and the videographers who are willing to make this video possible. The Women's Savings Action reps that Mo Margaret spoke about with the children in the video have been able to offer their brothers and sisters more options for giving via e-transfer, Canada Helps, check, and of course, cash. And with great thankfulness to the Lord, the reps have been able to collect 41000 $854.92. We are so thankful for this generosity, especially since last year, with its cloud of uncertainty, we collected $26,840.55. You've helped us to bridge the gap. Thank you, everyone, for remembering this work through your prayers and your financial support. Mr. Principal, this year, we pledge $40,000 to fund the seminary library. We pray that it may not only cause excitement for the sake of study, but also for the sake of spreading the light of the gospel. May God continue to bless the work of preparing laborers for the harvest. You know, brothers and sisters, every convocation has its, its regular highlights, and this is absolutely one of them. Not only do the ladies, the Women's Savings Action, the, the core committee, but also the ladies throughout the Federation work so hard, 
throughout the year to bring us to this very joyful moment of convocation. Not only do they, they bring in the dollars year after year under the Lord's blessing, of course, but this year, as you could have seen on the screen, they brought the kids back to the seminary. And it was actually a very touching moment. Now I'm getting a little emotional, but um, after the, it, it's such a beautiful thing because we, we have these children come in, these classes, uh, maybe twice a year or something, they come in, and, and this is what it's about. This is, this is the future of the church, and they're coming to check out the seminary and see about things. And that, too, uh, has not been able to happen for a better part of two years. And, and, and we miss that. We miss that. We really do. And we hope and pray that it can begin sometime soon again. We'll see what the Lord brings us. But for this moment, the kids were back at the seminary, and it's all caught on video. And hopefully it will serve as a blessing to the work of the Women's Savings Action from, uh, from coast to coast and from school to school. So once again, on behalf of everyone at the seminary, thank you very much.
Let us now together turn to Lord our God and we give to him praise for this beautiful evening. And we thank him also for the many blessings he has given to us uh, through the work of the seminary and the students who are able to graduate also this evening. So let us then give our thanks to God. Heavenly God, merciful, merciful Father, we come to you this evening with thanksgiving in our hearts that you are God who has revealed yourself in the most wonderful way. Lord, we, we live in this earth, and we often speak about the fact that you are our God, and yet the reality is that you seem to often to be so far away. We think about you being in the heavens where we're not able to see you, and yet you are a God who has come near to us, you came near to your people Israel and also through the means of the temple that you instructed them to build. You also gave them a clear sign that you were a God who lived in their midst. You're not a God who is far away, but a God who is very near. And so, Lord, we thank you that you also came and you tabernacled among us in your son, Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is indeed the true temple. For in him... You have dwelled richly. In Christ, we have come face to face with you as the living God. We've come to see your glory, your majesty, your power. And Lord, above all, we have been confronted with your compassion, with your love and with your mercy, that you gave your only Son and that our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to come and to give his life, that he's willing to, to lay down his life. And Lord, we know that, yes, his body was destroyed in death. But death wasn't able to hold him, but he rose up again into life. And that it is in him now that you are also gathering together for yourself a, a new people. A people chosen to everlasting life. A people whom you have called to glorify and, and to praise your holy name. And so, Lord, we thank you that you also give to us this seminary. A place where, where men are able to come and able to study, where they're able to be instructed with regard to your holy word, but not just a matter about knowing more about you, but that they may also grow in their love and their relationship with you, understanding that they too are being built up into a glorious temple and that they have been called to, to then also work within the churches when you give that call in order that you may proclaim in order that your name may be proclaimed, that Jesus Christ may indeed be taught in a way that he becomes real in the lives of your people, that your people may indeed praise and glorify your holy name. And so, Lord, we thank you that you then also continue to give students here at this seminary. And so this evening we praise you that a number of students were able to graduate. We thank you, Lord, also for this blessing. We pray for our brother Raul Kingma and his wife and family as they've also graduated now and we pray that you'll be with Raul as he sorts out also the future for himself and for his family. Will you also lead him, will you guide him, give him wisdom also for future decisions that may need to be made. Lord, we thank you that our brother Rud Ofringa was able to sustain his examinations this week and that he is now eligible for call, and we pray that you may then also grant that blessing that he may receive a call in due time, that he may be able to take up ministry in one of your churches. We also pray, we also give you our thanks that our brother Kevin Starr and our brother Timothy Veenstra were both able to also receive their decrees and that, and that they are now also continuing on with an internship Lord, we pray that you may bless Kevin as uh, he is busy uh, working for a few months in Ottawa and Tim as he is working in, in Mercy. We uh, pray uh, that this may also be a blessing to them and that in due time they may present themselves to classes and that they too may uh, be eligible for call uh, among your churches. Lord, we also thank you for the work that's being done around the world. We think of our brother Kim Lapiz in, in, in the Philippines. We thank you, Lord, that he's able to uh, also receive his degree his bachelor degree, and, and we pray that you, may, that you may bless him as he leads also his congregation here and there in that country. 
We thank you, Lord, for also the, the blessing that the Reformed faith is, is growing in that per, part of the world. And we pray that, that you will also bless the, churches, the church and churches in, to which she belongs, that, that they may indeed be a blessing, that you may allow them to grow also in that part of the world. Lord, we pray that you be with the uh, seminary as the new school year is, is beginning. And we uh, pray that you will grant your blessing over the professors as they again take up their task. Give them wisdom and strength for the work that they need to do. Uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, the, the new students who are coming in. We uh, also have heard that you've also blessed the seminary with a, a large group of students, some 12 uh, this year, and for a total of 32 students. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that there may be good harmony among the students and also between the professors and the students. We pray that you remember the students also, or the professors during this time. Because what a blessing it is to have many students, but it also increases their workload. And so we pray that you will uh, strengthen the professors for the work that they need to do, that they may carry also the load that is being placed uh, upon them. Well, Lord, we also uh, pray for the staff. Will you continue to grant the staff what uh, they need as they give support uh, to the uh, professors and to the students at the seminary? Uh, Lord, they're indeed a, a great blessing. We pray for the board. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We have a dedicated board that uh, also looks, overlooks the work of the seminary. And there is a tremendous work that is being done uh, by the board as uh, they give direction uh, for the work that is being done here in this institution. Oh, Lord, we pray that you may bless the, the strategic uh, plans that have been put into place and, and that also that the future plans may indeed be blessed in a way that uh, the seminary may become more efficient, may become more effective also in its uh, work. Lord, we pray that you will remember also the relations that we have with uh, the churches that support us. Sometimes the seminary may be here in Hamilton and may seem to be far away from uh, churches across this land and perhaps across the world in Australia, South Africa, and other nations as well. And we pray that that bond may nevertheless may, may still be there and that you may give opportunities for that bond to grow uh, so that your churches may continue to, to remember this work in their prayers, that they may uphold this work, and uh, that you may then also make, uh, indeed, the seminary a blessing in the midst of your churches. Oh Lord, we pray that you will also remember the collection that was taken this evening for the Foreign Student Bursary Fund. We are also grateful that there are many foreign students who are coming and who need to be supported. Lord, we also know that the fund itself will very quickly run out of money because of the great need that is there. So we pray that indeed this collection, this offering may indeed be blessed and that you may continue to provide also the material uh, means necessary in order to support men who want to study uh, from around the world. And so, Lord, we ask that you will grant us your blessing this evening, grant us a good evening with family and friends, and then we pray that you may then also receive a praises of thanksgiving. This we pray in the name of your Son, in Jesus Christ. Amen.